seated. Being that we had Mission Connection here this weekend, we've been blessed to have brothers and sisters who God has used all over the world in the cause of the gospel. And we were excited to be able to have Brad Buser here with us this morning. Brad has served for more than 20 years in Papua New Guinea with his wife and his children, involved in church planting and translation and consulting and language checking amongst the people group there. He also served as leadership for a boarding school for missionaries there in Papua New Guinea. And since he's been back in the States, God has used Brad in really powerful ways, talking to groups of all different generations and ages about missions. He's been particularly used powerfully in talking to young people about world evangelism due to Brad's passion for the cause of the gospel cross-culturally. So Brad resides in San Diego with his family. We're going to see a short intro video about Brad and his work. And then once the video's over, give Brad a huge round of applause as he comes on up to share God's heart and word with us. The idea of living in the villages was new to the Itetis. The Itetis by nature were nomadic people. As one would guess, it was a shock for us to initially live among the Itetis. We knew nothing of their language, and they knew nothing of ours. As different as they seemed to be, we found that they too didn't enjoy having lice in their hair, spending long amounts of time to pick or squish the lice and nits. Climbing beetle nut trees to pick the nuts themselves is something every boy learns to do. Gathering beetle nut and chewing it is like their version of having a cup of mocha. It's also the preferred way of cleaning up bad breath. The majority of their time was spent just gathering food, planting gardens, hunting pigs, or poisoning fish. These were great times for our kids too. Raising them among the Itetis was something we've never regretted. As my days were occupied with learning to speak their language, Beth would be doing medical work daily giving shots, antibiotics, worm treatments, eye ointments. This was one way of loving the Itetis that they could understand long before we could present the message of Christ to them. Nevertheless, death is relentless, especially in a climate like theirs. For the Itetis' death was a supreme frustration, the ultimate evidence their manipulation of the spirit world was not adequate. they were subject to a power that was out of their control. Finally, in 1985, after four and a half years of studying their language and culture, we were able to begin teaching them of God's love for them, how He showed that love by sending His Son, the Christ. Thank you. 
With no background, this took seven months of teaching, five days a week. Finally, in March of 1986, the first Yeteti man in the history of the world came to understand Jesus had come and died for his sins. very much. Uh, boy, what a weekend to be here. Uh, my word, this place was just rocking. We pull in uh, Friday about uh, 6.30 trying to get in here. There's a traffic jam a mile away from this church. And uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you, one of the things that impressed me as I was here is just... Uh, it spoke well of you guys as a congregation, as a staff, uh, as, as a body of believers. Uh, your facilities were abused this weekend. Uh, they were trampled. Uh, there was food ground into every square inch of carpet. Uh, tents nearly set up you know, for people to sleep in. It was crazy. And it was all for the sake of your Savior's honor and glory uh, that the nations would hear about what Jesus did. And so I just want to commend you guys for having a, an attitude that's bigger than just, well, we might have stains. It might, you know, we might have scratches in the paint. Uh, it was worth it, guys. It was worth it. Uh, because of this weekend, I have all confidence that there will be folks uh, in corners of this planet that you and I will never see. That some of the people that were here this weekend, they will go and reach those areas of the world. They will go and share the message of Jesus Christ. So, uh, man, kudos to you guys, and keep a big, uh, a big picture in your mind always in that sense. Um, <clears throat> yeah, fascinating time uh, getting to hear Ravi. Uh, a, a young uh, woman, uh, Libby Little, was here on Saturday afternoon and talked about her 30 years in Afghanistan. And I'll tell you what, I get to a lot of missions conferences, and a lot of times I do the talking, uh, but I had the privilege of just sitting there in the background and listening to this dear sister in the Lord uh, talk about what it was like uh, when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan uh, with her young children right there watching the tanks roll down the streets and the Soviets were afraid for her, her husband and children and, uh, and they, they sent tanks in to get uh, that family out and they said no, we're staying and uh, Libby buried her husband in Afghanistan uh, recently uh, for the gospel's sake, for our Savior's sake. Um, the last words of the Lord Jesus 
All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. That was the focus of the weekend. It should be the focus of our lives. It should be the focus of everything. But for this weekend to, ha- to have that uh, time and, and uh, in a sense, uh, set apart uh, days and hours, uh, meant to see this lobby out here filled with men and women uh, setting up booths and talking about their own experience and in many different ways being a part of that. Uh, I'll tell you what, I was just energized to be here. Uh, my wife and I, we, uh, as we said in the video there, we arrived in New Guinea in 1979. Uh, I grew up in San Diego, California. I was surfing my brains out, uh, doing surfing contests. I got saved in the middle of my senior year. And uh, I had all intentions of being a professional surfer for Jesus. That's what, uh, within a, a week after getting saved, that's what guys were telling me I should do. Except we had this stinking, rotten youth pastor in our church. And he taught us God's word. We called him a youth pastor from hell because nobody really liked our youth pastor. He was audacious. Uh, he was courageous. He didn't have a lot of buddies in the youth group, but we came and listened to him by the hundreds. Uh, our church, by the way, was about three, 400 people. Our youth group on Wednesday nights, 500 to 1,000 coming to listen to this man who never went to college a day in his life. He was gifted and he was gutsy. And he wasn't out to make buddies out of 18-year-olds when he was in his 40s. He would teach us God's word. He would talk about a world that needed to be reached with the gospel. And who's going to step up and do it? And as soon as I got saved, this is all I was hearing. And so as a young guy, uh, I was saved two and a half months. And what else could I do? As as he taught us about Matthew uh, 28, 19, and 20, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20, Acts 1. The mandate of Jesus again and again and again. Therefore, go and make disciples of of all nations, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the earth. Right now, this morning, as we are sitting here today with literally thousands of translations in the English language, literally, do you know that there's give or take 2,000 languages on this planet without one verse of scripture? Without one gospel worker, some of those are in the hundreds, some are in the thousands, some are in the tens of thousands, and there's a few in China, in the millions that have never been impacted by the gospel. There's not one Christian tract in their language. How can this be? How can it be? How can, how can we be in the year 2013 and we're still talking about thousands of languages untouched by the gospel? I, I, I can't get my head around that, guys. <clears throat> And what were, what were they talking about in generations past? I don't know. We're not responsible for the sins of those living 100 years ago. We're not responsible for the ages that will be coming behind us. But we are responsible for this day and age that we're in. Uh, missions uh, has always had that edginess to it. It's not a popular topic. As I was sharing with folks last night, occasionally I get to do a men's conference. I really like that. I really like men's conferences. Men's conferences are fun. I don't know what ladies' conferences are like. You know, I don't really want to know. But... Uh, <clears throat> My wife comes back. She's always wrung out. She's like, what the heck did they do to you? It was great. It was just great. Was, she can't ever describe it. You know, just like, oh, shut up. You know, just, I don't, I don't whatever. You know, just, you know, I, I just, I'm, anyway. Men's conferences are awesome. You get there. First thing you do, you unpack your stuff, you know, and you eat a bunch of crap food, okay? And uh, you hang out at night. You stay awake telling all kinds of lies and exaggerations. And everybody, you know, measures testosterone and stuff like that. And the next morning you get up. You have some Bible times. Then you go out and play football. And then you have steak. I always have steak at a men's conference on Saturday night. And uh, at the end of the weekend, you got, you know, 40 or 50 new buddies, you know, sing Kumbaya, you know, it's all cool. It's, it's great. Men's conferences, you make a lot of friends. When I come to missions conferences, I don't make a lot of friends. <laughs> because the, the message that our Savior left us behind, the capstone message of his life was come and die. Come walk away from your life, your dream, your ambition, your passion. Come and die at my feet. And I'm going to give you a new one. I want to use you. I want to use you to reach the nations. Peter, I know you're a pretty good fisherman. Walk away. Luke, you're a pretty good doctor. Walk away. Matthew, you're a pretty good tax collector. Walk away. I've got a thing. I've got a thing. I have people uh, tell me all the time, man, missions is obviously your thing. My thing is worship. And I've talked to guys like that. I said, oh, who do you worship? What did he say? My thing is the family. It's kind of like, you know, we've got this uh, big bag here and, and we can reach in there and we have the ladder to, to pull out anything. Well, why? I'm going to focus on, whoa, yeah, that sounds cool. I'll tell you what, if I had a thing, my thing would be surfing. 
And I tried to ramp that up into my thing, my niche, my, you know, yeah, it's all good. Yeah, man, ocean, love that, good. Yeah, all kinds of accolades, blah, 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 blah. God was saying, yeah, whatever, whatever. I love the world. Get in line. I love the world. Walk away from your thing. I love the world. I gave my son that all peoples, every tongue, tribe, and nation would hear. You know, missions has changed a lot in the last hundred years. You used to have missionaries going to all parts of the world, colonizing, making them into where, if they're from England, making them in, into Englanders, you know, and, and making them into Americans. You know, that, that day has passed. Uh, <clears throat> missionaries had all kinds of uh, things they had to deal with in the past. Uh, man, diseases were huge. Cannibalism was a real factor. Uh, in the part of New Guinea where we were, our people cannibalized, cannibalized each other uh, seven years pri- previous to us moving in there. Every one of the men you saw whose names was uh, written there uh, that are currently elders in the churches. Every one of them were cannibals before. Uh, that's not a long ago practice in some parts of New Guinea, our part being one of them. Our people were also serial rapists. Uh, we won't get into uh, some of the particulars of that, but uh, <clears throat> missions has changed a lot. P- uh, people aren't worrying about diseases too much anymore. Um, hostage taking is uh, more the, the common thing. Uh, just in the mission board I served with, we had six people, six men shot and executed uh, as they were taken hostage. Uh, that's what missionaries need to look in the eye as they go overseas. <clears throat> and even as the, uh, the landscape of missions has changed uh, and, and new issues come to the surface all the time, uh, I, I guess this morning I want to talk about one that, that, that is very distressing. And I don't even know how to, to enter into it graciously. But it's the issue of the family. The issue of the family, husband, wife, parenting, children, expectations, issues surrounding this concept that is so spoken of in the scriptures, that is so ordained by God. And yet currently, because of the pressures that the world has put on the family from many, many points on the compass, at times, at times the response of the church and the response of, of folks who mean well has been an overreaction to that. To where God himself can't even touch the family. It was interesting as our sister Libby talked yesterday in one of her sessions about what it had cost her and the dangers that she put her children in. One of the voices that was talking outside, uh, that was wrong. That was wrong to do that. How dare they put their children in danger? And uh, we speak with discordant voices today. We don't understand what's first, what's primary, what's supreme. And so I just want to take this warning because, folks, too often as churches, man, vibrant churches that understand the heart of God, and man, I've got, if I've not gotten nothing else, I've gotten this, this church gets it. They understand that God's heart, our Savior's heart, beats for the world, the world, the world. That's the ethos of this church. And yet as we send people out, if we as a church, we can't expect our missionaries to hold the bar where it should be held if we're not holding the bar. And too often as stresses come to our dear brothers and sisters who serve overseas, and the message at times that they need to hear is stay faithful, stand strong, we are praying for you. Too often our own commitment is wobbly. We don't understand even what Christ expects from us who go and us who stay. And oftentimes churches are the first voice to say, come on home, that's dangerous. Come on home, there could be jeopardy in store for you. Come on home, this doesn't look good. Come on home, the stresses are high. Come on home. Because your safety, your survival, your health is obviously more important than anything you might be doing out there. And I know I'm an out-of-sync voice. This might be the the rarest of times we we speak in terms like this. And if it was just me talking like this, and my background, my dad was in the Navy, and I won't go into that one there, and my wife, my wife, we're like, my wife and I are totally different people. My wife was raised out in the country in Michigan. Her dad was a pastor of this little farm church, you know, and uh, she grew up 10 miles from the nearest place to buy a gallon of milk. She went to a one-room schoolhouse. She was Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. She was the Virgin Mary, okay? I was Darth Vader, drug, sex, alcohol, blah, 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 Southern California, okay? So Satan married the Virgin Mary, and uh, I've learned to appreciate uh, uh, the broader spectrum of life, okay? And she's grown some horns. (laughs) She's a tough lady, though. But anyway, how did that even come up? (laughs) As we send people overseas, 
We need to understand what they're getting into. And we need to get into it with them. We need to go back and hear. And if folks, if it was just me talking about this, well, that's Brad. I, 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 I trust I wouldn't even speak what I'm going to share this morning. But the reality is, as we look in the word of God, as we hear what the Lord, Jesus Christ, and he did not give suggestions. As we listen to the words of Jesus regarding family, every single time it comes up, his words would be, wow, that's different. Didn't expect that. Let's start in Luke chapter 2 this morning. Luke chapter 2. <clears throat> and he doesn't take a whole chapter and talk about family, so we don't have a, a, a wonderful passage like 1 Corinthians 13. Love, I love that chapter. I, tell you what's a challenge to me we don't have hebrews 11 talk about faith uh, we don't have a, a, a great long passage to go into but we have these snippets where it comes up and his voice is so clearly different than what we might expect in luke chapter 2 obviously uh, jesus and his parents have gone down to the uh, temple in uh, jerusalem and he's 12 years old and um uh, Jesus stays behind his mom and dad, big crowd. They don't, you know, maybe know what he's doing. And so a couple days into it, they realize their son's not with them. They turn around. They're like every other parent. They'd be uh, very excited and apprehensive and concerned. And so they turned around and they finally uh, located where their son was. He was right back there in the temple courts teaching, (laughs) 12 year old teaching. That's a, a, a strange one. And, uh, verse 48 says this, when his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. It says they were astonished. We really don't know what they were astonished about. Uh, We're not given clarity on that, but we know they were astonished. And uh, Mary gives a a very motherly, very understandable uh, exhortation, kind of a gasp, kind of a, come on, you're killing me. What parent has not... Looked around and their little four year old's not there. Their two year old, what the heck? Where'd he go? You know, man, that, that rush of anxiety and fear. Uh, man, if you're a parent and you can't uh, you know, identify with that, man, you've had a, a stellar up you know, <laughs> track record. Because, man, that happened all the time to us. I, told, I was telling some people in a seminar yesterday, I remember the, the Teddies were always asking us, man, l- let us take your kids. Let us teach them how to hunt. Let us teach them how to fish. And uh, our oldest son was five years old. And uh, I was working with my wife on this because by this time here, our oldest son could speak Teddy fluently. He could speak Teddy, He could speak Melanesian and English fluently. Okay, I said, honey, come on. You know, I, I know enough about these guys. They're not going to do anything weird or perverse. And so the Teddies took our five-year-old son and our three-year-old son, and uh, they were going to go off for a couple hours. Well, a couple hours turned into 10 hours, okay? And my wife said, where are they? Where are you? And I was amped up too. I understand that. I get that. Now, we, we didn't do it at the shopping mall. Our kids did it in the jungle. So losing your kids is common to all. It's just the particulars change. So Mary, understandably uh, worried, anxious, uh, utters this. Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Very understandable. And yet Jesus is going to call her back to remembrance. Jesus is going to, hey, touch that nerve there. Hey, mom, remember? Remember Gabriel's voice? Dad, do you remember when he said go to Egypt? Do you remember Annas? Anna, you remember when you you dedicated me at the temple? Do you remember those things? Do you remember all that time away? Do you remember the three magi that came? Do you remember that stuff? God has something for me. God has something for me. And so in light of that, Jesus would reply and he says, why are you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Um, I can remember... When we lived among the Teddies, uh, we had five people in the village we lived in. We had five people killed by snakes in the 20 years that we lived there. Snakes, death adders were a very real, not possibility. They were a very real presence. Uh, to watch someone die from a snake bite is not fun. We've watched people die from a number of different things. And I, after the first time I watched that happen, I never saw my kids go out the door, into the grass, into the village, into the jungle, that my heart wasn't gripped. And at the same time, I remember because both of those sons, before we went to New Guinea, at different times, we dedicated them to the Lord. They're yours. They're yours. They're yours. 
And I know that's probably the case with the majority of folks here, if not in a formal setting, at least informally, at the, at the, the, in the hospital or when you brought your child home. And if you haven't done that, why not? They are a temporary gift from God, a temporary trust entrusted to us. And they are his. They are his. And Jesus is saying exactly that to his mom. Mom, I'm actually not yours. Remember that. If anyone should have known that, above all mothers, it should have been Mary. But Jesus reminds his mother of that. And I think a lot of moms here need to be reminded, and fathers too. Temporary. Temporary. I am the Lord's. I am the Lord's. And folks, let me say this right now. I, I know that there are people here who don't know the Lord Jesus as Savior. Uh, you're, uh, you're coming here. You're checking out what is it to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, what I'm talking here isn't even Christianity 101. This is hard stuff even for Christians. Okay, so I, I just want to make that case clearly. Uh, let's turn over here uh, to another passage, Luke chapter 8, verse 19, and see another place where Jesus, the, the, the concept of the family comes up here in this context. And again... Um, Very, very different. Jesus is now in the middle of his ministry. He's not a 12-year-old little boy anymore. At this point here in Luke chapter 8, there's masses coming to Jesus, kind of like Friday night coming to listen to Ravi Zechariah. And, uh, you know, his mom and dad couldn't even get in. And uh, anyway, verse 19 of Luke chapter 8 says this, Now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Wow, that's, you know, unfortunate. And someone told him, hey, your mom and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. Now, remember, this is a culture where family is huge. Man, we are the sons of Abraham. We are the sons of Moses. We are the offspring of David. We are the people of Israel, of the land of the prophets, the law. We are the people. The blood lineage was huge. Man, Paul understood that. I'm a Benjamite. Everybody knew their lineage. That was gigantic. Family names might be somewhat similar to us here in the United States of America in this day and age, but not even close. That might be the closest way we could understand this. But Jesus is is living and, and walking in an age where that was gigantic. Your mother and brothers are coming. They're here outside. And this is not a flippant response of Jesus. Jesus wasn't cavalier. Jesus wasn't cutting. But he would never miss an opportunity to clarify. And thus his answer speaks to us even now. My mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put them into practice. It's not about blood. It's not about blood lineage. That's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. Of course, I have a a unique and a special responsibility to my wife. Love my wife. We've been married for 37 years. I have a unique and special responsibility to my three sons, to my one daughter, to my four grandchildren. Man, what a privilege. Uh, My two older boys, those little boys that came with us to New Guinea, they are now back in New Guinea. Uh, One lives in the jungle situation similar to this, uh, what you saw on the screen, uh, among a group of guys called the Yembi Yembis. Phenomenal what God is doing there. Totally different people group than where he was raised. Another son, he got his degree in mathematics. He came back to the States and he was a really sharp uh, young guy. Blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and uh, paid off his college debts. And he said, Dad, you know what? I was meant for more. And uh, he walked away from his accounting career. And he's now back on the island of BM. It's a volcanic island, 80 miles out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And uh, my wife, actually, he was able to Skype my wife from the middle of the ocean. (laughs) It's just crazy what happens in this day and age. Music to our ears. And as much as I love those boys, I'll tell you, if you're a dad, you've never heard any words sweeter than, Hey, Dad, when I pick up the phone and it's one of my sons from overseas, I don't get to see them hardly at all and I hear those words hey dad did you hear hey dad did you know what Brandon did hey dad I tell you what if that doesn't make a a dad's knees buckle and yet Jesus is saying here special special relationship absolutely preeminent relationship no mistaking number one relationship keep clarity keep clarity keep clarity because I cannot be a godly dad here If this isn't strongly understood by me and by them, my father's first responsibility is to his God, to his God. 
My husband's first responsibility is to his God, to his God. And we can't be godly husbands, wives, mothers, or fathers unless we understand that and live that out. Because what we will model to our children will speak way more than what we say to our kids. Do they know your first responsibility is to your God? Have they seen that? While we were in New Guinea, <clears throat> what, was, um, what was right, what God was asking of us in relationship to service for him was almost always beneficial to my family. What was most of the time, what God would have me do was beneficial to my family. That wasn't hard. Meant to be a godly dad there, man. Meant, for one thing, I made sure my kids took anti-malarial medication every week. They hated it. When they were little guys, we had to give it to them in shots. So that malaria, even though it was in their system, it wouldn't overcome them. My kids got malaria countless times, even with that. But it didn't kill any of them. Malaria, we lost 65% of the Itedi people before we moved in due to malaria. My kids all got dengue fever, hepatitis, black water fever, uh, Worms, lice, blah, blah. How'd you keep your kids from getting those things? Someone asked me that the other day uh, before I, ch- I did not share this yesterday. How'd you keep the, your kids from getting those diseases? We tried. And I could tell them we did that. We, we did try. We gave them every uh, form of medication possible in a preventative way. But you know what? God wanted to see a church planted among the Itedi people. And so God, in his wisdom and love for all peoples, said it's important that Brad's children get malaria. We were literally not lost all four of our children at different points while we were there. It was important for the Itedis to know these guys are paying a price to be here. It added credibility to the gospel. We speak from our scars. Paul would say again and again, don't mess with me. I bear on my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. That is the credibility. Jesus had credibility. Why, why did Jesus wait until he was 30 years old before he started his ministry? Credibility. He, couldn't, he knew everything at 12, obviously. He wouldn't be an accepted voice among the community until he was 30 years old. You could not speak to religious matters until you were 30 years old. Everybody knew that. He started his ministry at 30. Credibility. What's our credibility? Our scars. Living among them. Putting our families in jeopardy. They, them knowing as with Libby and her husband, knowing they really love us. They're not bailing every time the rebels come through. We had rebels coming through all the time. We prepared our kids. We had Bible studies when our kids were home. This is why we live where we live. You might say, well, that's, hey, you guys were out there in kind of a strange situation. You had to clarify those things. Let me tell you, you want your kids to be lukewarm? Live for the yearly vacation. Live for the retirement. Take joy and glee and the new car, and the renovation. Oh yeah, I come to church. Well, we had them in Sunday school. We had them in the youth group. We took them on mission trips. Your modeling will impact your kids way more than what is said from a youth pastor and from your own lips. They know what geeks you up. They know what you look forward to. Is your love for the Lord Jesus so evident to your kids that it's costing you? This is, of course we could afford a new car. Do you know that this couple is on their way to Uzbekistan? And we're driving this car for eight more years. And the money we would put toward that, (laughs) we just wrote out a $20,000 check so they could be there on the field another six more months. That's what your mom and dad, that's what we're all about. Yeah, who doesn't like a new car? And I'm, I'm, you know, it's not a car issue, guys. You know what I'm talking about. Who's first? Who's first? And Jesus would clarify here. My mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Turn to Luke chapter 12, another passage. Luke chapter 12. And again, we are skipping over so many. We're not going to go back and and read a ton that are in here. Luke chapter 12. Jesus says here in verse 49. And you know, when when he wants to bring the impact of the gospel of his life of fidelity to Jehovah God, to bear on those listening to him. He almost always touches on the family relationships. 
Verse 49, I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other. Three against two, two against three. They will be divided father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. Because I must be preeminent. I must be preeminent. Yes, I have a special relationship and responsibility to all of my children. Because they do love the Lord. And they understand what their father's about. Man, separation has been the bone, we call it. The backbone of our family. That's just been what the Lord has asked of us. He probably hasn't asked that of you guys. He's asked different things of you. The price tag you are expected to pay as followers of Jesus Christ. So that when you do walk across the aisle to talk to your co-worker, that your life smells. Why do we not want to talk to our co-worker? Uh, At times, we don't have the credibility. They know that we love and esteem and live for the very same things they do. We all need credibility to be effective messengers. Those in Uzbekistan, in New Guinea, and in Vancouver. And this is one of the ways we demonstrate that, is living sacrificially for our king. It's not the only way. Man, again, that that father and son, I, I I came to be preeminent, preeminent, preeminent. I want clarification at all times. Jesus is always doing that. Turn over to Luke chapter 14, across the page for some of you. Luke 14, he, <clears throat> we covered this passage yesterday evening. Jesus says here in Luke 14, verse 25, large crowds are traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. He's not talking about being haters. No, in fact, in John 13, he says just the opposite. He says, man, I, I want you to be, to spread the aroma of love and forgiveness and graciousness and acceptance. That's to be the, the, the way we smell. We are such... <sighs> people that accept and understand and have room and and understand the fallen condition man i shared last night some of my own fallenness we are broken people there's not a perfect man or woman sitting in here none of us can or have lived up completely to this if we're honest with ourselves. jesus isn't this isn't saying here we walk around as just butthead people just mm, hate 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 no of course not to my wife, get it, harsh, mean-spirited to my ch- No, no. But what he is saying is that in comparison to your love and adoration, dedication, allegiance to me, the clarity of your obedience and love and worship to me, that clarity in comparison to that, the relationship that you have even with your own wife looks like hatred. The gap is so large... There is nothing to be said for, well, God first and my wife second or my kids third. He said, no, that, 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 could, that could not be the case. That just can't even pop into your mind. That, as we shared last night, God is not first on our list. Jesus is saying here, I am the list. I'm first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eight, nine, ten. And your wife and those dear sons, daughters of yours, they're, they're way down the list. There's a huge gap. Do we have that kind of clarity here? Folks, it's hard, to, it's hard to retain that. We get that at times, I know. Sometimes when we're even just singing and worshiping together, we can, we can lose ourselves in those words. And we can. I believe those are, those are moments where we get refocused. It's so all about you. <laughs> yeah, don't care, don't care. Praise God for moments that give us a taste of that clarity. Hopefully our hearts long to have that clarity all the time. But folks, it takes deliberate, tangible steps at times. And it takes husbands and wives 
talking of these things, what are we actually teaching to our children? I know we love our kids, but what are we actually teaching them? That mom and dad are so tight, and mom and dad love us so much that even we wouldn't even allow God himself to touch those children. Folks, we better revisit the story in Genesis 22, Abraham offering up Isaac. Boy, I tell, I, I, folks, I read that story, and I shudder. Not, not necessarily at the knife coming down part, but it says Abraham, when he heard God's word, he, he took off the next day. And do you know what Abraham had to do? He walked. For three days he walked with Isaac at his side, his 14, 15-year-old son at his side. I've got sons. I know the kind of talking that happens. Here's Isaac, the little knucklehead. Hey, Dad, man, what are we, we going to do over here? Man, when are we going to go back and go fishing? When are we going to shear the sheep? Hey, Dad, you know, talking trash with his dad. You know, and Abraham, the whole time, I'm going to have to put a knife in you. You can't say it. Living with this thought. I remember when we arrived in New Guinea, and uh, we knew that we would someday be putting our kids on an airplane to go off to the boarding school. That's not a common thing anymore. I'm not an advocate for boarding schools. I'm not a, a, a negator of boarding schools. It was just a reality for where we were living among the teddies. And uh, <clears throat> the years came and went, and we knew that a few years down the road we'd have to do that. And finally, it was three years away that we knew that we would have to put our kids on an airplane. And two years away, a year away, a month away, and uh, finally the day came where that airplane landed. Airplane had landed many, 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 many times. The, this time here, I'll just share with you. you know, the, the t- day came and uh, took Brooks, my 17-year-old boy, put him on the airplane. Brandon, my 14-year-old son, put him on the airplane. Natalie, the apple of my eye, 12-year-old girl, put her on the airplane. And I felt like I was taking my, my intestines, my heart, my lungs, my kidneys. I felt like I was disemboweled. My whole being was on that plane. I was speechless. And my wife was, we were hollow as we stood there on the airship. That little single engine prop kicks up and gone. There's our kids on the wings of a little Cessna 185. Two and a half hours in the air. We would not see them for months. Um, Abraham's story speaks to me. And how you will live that out will be different than the particulars of our situation. I don't know how you'll live it out. But do you have clarity? Do you have that kind of clarity? Abraham received Isaac back. Hannah did not receive Samuel back. She went to the temple and dedicated Samuel. And he stayed and was raised by a pretty bad dad. Eli was not a good father. But Hannah fulfilled her vow Folks, we will never keep our mission. We can send missionaries all we want. They'll never have the gumption to stay where they need to stay if we don't have it here. If we're not ready to say, because we have dealt with this ourselves, if we're not ready to say, hang tough, we know these are hard times. Hang tough, we know it's dangerous. We're praying for you. If they're just out there making a name for themselves or making money or seeing the world or or gathering experiences, yeah, come on home, it's not worth it. But if they are actually gospel proclaimers building the eternal kingdom of God, seeing lives forgiven of their sin, coming into relationship with their God, if they're advancing the kingdom of the Lord Jesus, we can say, we must say, it's worth it. God forbid it costs you your son He is worth it. We sang that this morning. How many stanzas? You're worthy. Worthy of what? More than our songs. He's worthy of everything. And if he's worthy of everything, that includes my grandson, Brady. My grandson, Bo. I won't get into the particulars there. Folks, we need to cover these things before we get into battle. That's why we have missionaries that go through training. We've started a school in Tijuana. It's called Radius International. We train missionaries. We need to cover these issues with our missionary candidates before they go overseas into the blazing guns. They better walk through this. But we who send, we must do more than write checks and send emails. We need to deal with these issues here too. And as credibility becomes all of our Goal, and we move toward that, and the decisions we make will be better witnesses here, and we will be a better sending church for those who go. 
Let's turn over to Luke chapter 20. We'll see it again here. Jesus touching on this concept, and I'll close with this. Luke chapter 20, verse 27. We all know the Sadducees were people that didn't even believe in a resurrection, so they're totally talking out of two sides of their mouth here with this thing that they share with Jesus. In Luke 20, 27, <clears throat> some of the Sadducees who say there's no resurrection, they came to Jesus with a question. And it was, you know, they're just trying to <clears throat> trip Jesus up. They said, teacher, Moses wrote that if a brother, a man's brother dies and leaves a wife and no children, the man must marry the widow and have children with the brother. And, if there, were, and there were seven brothers and blah, 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 blah. There were these seven guys. They all died one at a time. They took the same wife. You know, there were no kids, blah, 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 blah. Spin this whole tale. Okay, Jesus, when they get to heaven, whose wife is she going to be? Try to answer that one. How many angels can dance on the head of a pin, you know? You know that kind of stuff. And Jesus replied in verse 44, he says, guys, get a clue. Jesus replied, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Marriage is temporary. Marriage is temporary. Parenting is temporary. What is eternal is the relationship we have with our God. And folks, I know this is a tough one, not because we hate these ones that we interact with. We love them so much. We can get so lost in these relationships. They can be. Now, let me tell you, I've had enough fights with my wife to know that marriage can be hell on earth. It's the closest thing to hell. And it's maybe the closest thing to heaven. It can be any of those two things. But when it's good, it's really good. It can be distractingly good. And my kids can give me so much joy. They can be distractingly fulfilling to me. Anything can be a source of distraction, good, bad, or indifferent. He can take alcohol. He can take pornography. He can take money. He can take fame. He can take athletic. He can take your kids, these wonderful little kids, and turn them into distractions. The enemy can use anything. He's a master at manipulating our minds and getting us distracted and turning that which is good into that which is a distraction and, in fact, becomes evil. Can God touch your family? Can he touch your family? Can he, can he get in there? You know, only you and your spouse can answer that. But folks, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake right now of 2,000 people groups, where we were in New Guinea, the Mariage, the Angarame, the Pei, the Blackwater, the Amal, the Yura people, people groups that right now today have nothing of the gospel. Those are some of the ones I know. I've never been to China. I don't even know the names of those ones over there. But I know there are people groups there. And we will not be the effective churches that we need. We need effective missionaries. And we need effective, grown-up, maturing churches that understand when we send them out, there could be a high price tag. They've looked that price tag in the eye. And we, as their sending church, have understood that. And we've looked it in the eye. And we have said, he is worth it. He is worth it. May God give us wisdom to be those people that can stand behind their missionaries. Yes, send them up. Yes, dedicate our sons and daughters as I shared Saturday morning. We don't need any more well-rounded Christian young people. You know that? I teach in Christian colleges all over. We don't need any more well-rounded Christian young people. That's just code lukewarm for, for lukewarm. It really is. It's Man, we need to raise our sons and daughters to be expendable for our king and for his purposes. And there will be blessing in that. And our kids will continue to give us deep, serious, eternal fulfillment. But we need to be deliberate in those ways, moms and dads. Let's pray. Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters here. Bless them. Lord, may we be overwhelmed with your worthiness. With the confidence that you do love our children. You do love our spouses. You, you have given us family and marriage for the joy and bliss that is here in those relationships. But Lord, may we not be lost in them. May we not be ungodly in our desire to get too much from them. In fact, getting from them what we should receive from you. Lord, give us a hunger and a passion for you that nothing but you can fulfill, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.